Uh, so it's my privilege and uh, good fortune to introduce to you tonight Paul Murray, the Dean and Director of the Center for Catholic Studies, which is a unit within Durham University's Department of Theology and Religion. Uh, Paul's wider global impact is probably known to most of you as a professor of systematic theology. Uh, he's been the creative force and central figure in the Receptive Ecumenism Initiative, uh, author of many articles and books, perhaps most notably in this setting, probably his Oxford University Press volumes on Receptive Ecumenism and Resource Mont. He's a member of ARCIC and a consultor to the Pontifical Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, which is the previous Council for Justice and Peace. Uh, he's also a great, if tireless and demanding, boss and mentor. I spent a year in a postdoctoral position working uh, for him on the receptive ecumenism stuff. So he's a tremendous mentor, and I'm personally excited to hear his comments tonight. Uh, he'll be speaking to us on formal ecumenism, receptive ecumenism, and the diverse local churches of the global Catholic community. So please help me in welcoming Paul. Well, good evening. Um, thank you very much, Mike, for those uh, that generous introduction. The check is in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, um, Bill, uh, very much, and Mike Goodey for the invitation to um, come and speak this evening, to share in this event. And um, thanks to Karen Kraft and Francis Salonel for ensuring that it happened and that we all got here um, safely. It's really very good to be able to share, again, in a DePaul and um, Global Catholicism Week. I think that the, the hosting of these weeks is a really very important initiative um, in the Catholic ecclesial learning and conscientization as we seek to learn what it might mean for us to be a genuinely world church. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of personal situation and such like. I should also warn you that um, I don't multitask terribly, terribly fluently, but I'm going to attempt a PowerPoint here. I was, I'm just responding well, been a, trying to be a good student of uh, Francis's um, instructions. So I've put together a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it could go disastrously wrong, um, but it gives you something prettier to look at than the speaker. Um, now, my, uh, my personal context, I grew up in I grew up as part of the Liverpool Irish of the referred to in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, the Liverpool Irish, that was a community strongly conscious of being a largely immigrant, misfit Catholic community, Catholic minority in an historically Protestant country, um, with pictures of Italian popes on our walls, grandparents with clear and frequently rehearsed memories of religious discrimination, a sizable Polish language community in our parish with their own mass, and frequent visits of religious to our school with fascinating stories of our Catholic sisters and brothers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. South America, sorry. Uh, so this all contributed to my um, growing <coughs> up with uh, what I would say is an, was an inchoate but nevertheless real sense of sharing by virtue of being Catholic um, in a worldwide communion, a worldwide communion with the center of one's identity, not being the nation with its Protestant queen, but somewhere else. I, rem I recall, and um, this happened a few times, I recall my father expressing his appreciation sometimes that the mass, even in the vernacular, gave one a common liturgical currency, such that one could basically go anywhere in the world, um, still be able, regardless of linguistic comprehension, still be able to understand what was going on, and able to situate oneself within it. So what I'm wanting to say is that even in my, um, what was very definitely a somewhat parochial, um, indeed somewhat tribal, somewhat northern, well very northern, insular existence, and the Catholic imaginary in which I was formed had a certain, a certain undeveloped but global orientation to it, even if that was in a very somewhat vague and underdefined manner. Catholicism and globalization should be in conversation with each other, or the, the global world is what we're saying. It's a, a no-brainer, as the youth say. Now, many years later, uh, one of the um, 
one of the most strongest effective experiences I had of the World Church was during my first pilgrimage to Rome, which um, there was no coincidence in the fact that that was, I was um, well into my 40s by the time that um, took place. And I made that with, um, I mean, Rome would have represented some of the aspects of Catholicism that I would feel less comfortable with, I suppose, um, symbolically. Um, so I made this in 2005. We spent eight days living beside the Basilica of St. Paul's, outside the walls. And the, 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 the naming of that is very significant, St. Paul and the situation, St. Paul's outside the walls. And traveling in each day to the center point of St. Peter's. And this, this daily back and forth from St. Paul's outside the walls to St. Peter's, this daily back and forth communicated a sense by the end of the week of, um, of there being a pulsating rhythm or there should be at least a pulsating rhythm to Catholicism, a kind of living between the Pauline instinct for outward facing mission and locality, diverse locality, and the Petrine instinct for the holding of this rich pluriformity in centered communion. And our week culminated in, um, a Wednesday, in the Wednesday uh, general papal audience for which we'd been given tickets on the raised area immediately beneath the steps of St. Peter's, so looking out over the square. Now, as any of you who have done this will know, you have to be there some hours in advance of the actual Pope show in order to secure your position. And um, our vantage point on the steps looking out gives a wonderful perspective on the square as it's uh, filled up with groups of pilgrims, seemingly from every nation on earth. Many sporting the national colours, the banners of patron saints, or the names of the diocese, parish, or school from which they came, and indeed were intent on making their presence felt. It seemed as though the whole world was gathered there in the embrace of Bernini's colonnades. And I think um, it struck me at the time, and it stayed with me, I think there was something deeply appropriate in the fact that the real power of the experience of the audience resided not in the cult and personality of the Pope, but in the pluriform pilgrim people of God, and this sense of the global Catholic communion gathered in celebration, prayer, and joy. After all, the true function of the papacy, is it not, is to be the structural and sacramental focus of the communion of the dispersed, diverse people of God. Well, all wonderful stuff, but that, of course, was a very Catholic experience. Um, another significantly less Catholic experience of the World Church, for which I remain grateful, was when I was invited to be an independent observer at the 2009 General Assembly of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches in Crete. And there was a quite remarkable diversity of ethnicity, national context, and ecclesial um, uh, diversity represented there. Indeed, it was the richest such mix I've ever experienced. And there was a correspondingly strong sense of fraternal and sororal appreciation across this diversity, a, di a sense which I am um, very happily fully shared. But there was also, nevertheless for me, um, something of a sense of the gathering as lacking either a center or any great depth of communion. I mean, take the conversation, the theological conversations, they tended to focus either on case studies in theological ethics relating to particular practical issues arising in various ecclesial and missiological contexts, or they focused on somewhat minimalist discussions of what could be said together in the then prospective convergence document on which the Faith and Order Commission was working towards a common vision of the church. There was um, little or no space or explicit encouragement, however, given to working theologically precisely from out of the diverse particularities that were gathered there and the challenges and possibilities which they represented for each other. And uh, with that, it needs also to be acknowledged that the rather small Catholic contingent, I, I wasn't part of the official Catholic contingent, all of whom had been 
um, were there as representatives of the Pont Pontifical Council for Christian Unity. Um, I was, I'd been invited because of the work in receptive ecumenism. But the, the, the Catholic contingent was um, remarkably global north and remarkably Caucasian in makeup. So what I'm wanting to say, that's a roundabout way to getting back to saying, I really do think that these DePaul Global Catholicism Weeks are tremendously uh, important. Um, I applaud the way in which you seek to take both the particularity of Catholicism and its immense global diversity <coughs> equally seriously, as you do also the need to pursue the live issues in Catholic conversation in a manner that is attentive both to this internal plurality and to what can be learned from the distinctive particularities and experience of the other Christian traditions. So I, I thank you for this. Um, these are themes about which I'll be speaking in this paper. And for me personally, uh, this represents a really great learning opportunity for which I'm enormously grateful. As this meeting is um, without question the most genuinely global conversation uh, uh, about Catholicism and ecumenism, that, that joint topic in which I've had the privilege to participate in terms of the representation uh, in the room and the, the range of speakers and context represented there. So um, I'm not sure whether the abstracts that we sent in were circulated, but those who have seen it, you'll see that I say that I come not just with a paper, but also with questions. Um, questions in, in relation to which I'm really very keen to learn from your own diverse experience and perspectives. So um, I describe the, what I'm offering as having the character of a paper come consultation. And I hope that we can um, do some of that in the, the open time um, afterwards. I'm forgetting about my PowerPoint, aren't I? Um, <laughs> right, so as uh, Mike said in his introduction, I've been asked to speak about the distinctive strategy of receptive ecumenism and its potential relevance for the global reach of the Catholic Church. And perhaps the first thing to say is that um, whilst receptive ecumenism is regarded, is understood as representing a distinctive strategy in contemporary ecumenism, it's one that has um, uh, deep Catholic roots and precedent, and deep roots in the ecumenical movement, and um, very significant precedent in the ecumenical movement. It's not kind of being born de novo, but is really, as William James would put it, a new name for some old ways of thinking. Uh, it also has strong um, Catholic resonance to us, I think, which will become apparent in what I'm exploring. Perhaps the second thing to say is that, uh, or another thing to say though, is that uh, receptive ecumenism is understood as being intentionally in service of what I um, will refer to as formal ecumenism, or in fact I refer to it in the slightly cumbersome phrase of formal theological ecclesial ecumenism, and I'll explain what I mean by these terms in a moment. Um, now let me just put out the, the three questions which following the presentation I'm going to uh, hope to explore with you. So first, question about how does the importance, um, how is the importance of the formal ecumenical agenda um, manifest in global south context? Where and how, if at all, is that um, evident, what I'm uh, wanting to, to refer to in these ways. Secondly, how does what I'm going to explore as the Catholic instinct for the need to hope for and work towards full structural and sacramental communion, how does that, um, how might that engage with global south contexts? And the third question is, how might the thinking, instinct and practice of receptive ecumenism take specific root and come to particular flower in your own uh, ecclesial, cultural, regional context. So I'm going to return to those at the end, but um, you might kind of want to have them percolating away uh, whilst I um, give yourself something to be distracted on, whilst I'm babbling away in front of you, because they're the questions I will um, be grateful to, to explore later. Um, I lay the ground for posing these questions basically through four steps. So the first part of the lecture I'm calling the necessity and challenge of formal theological ecclesial ecumenism. 
by formal sorry, by formal theological ecclesial ecumenism. I don't I'm not referring simply to any and all structured gatherings of representatives of diverse Christian traditions. Uh, by this um, somewhat cumbersome phrase, I'm specifically referring to um, the classical faith and order concern to seek full structural and sacramental communion between the traditions. And with that, I am um, referring also to the concern to seek to overcome any dividing differences between the traditions, any dividing differences, and um, we can uh, we could distinguish dividing differences from uh, non-dividing distinctions. Okay, so the, the line behind this is not the assumption that um, formal humanism is not aimed at uniformity. You know, diversity is not considered an in principle bad thing. But diversity, that um, differences that divide. Uh, are uh, in the in the perspective of formal ecumenism are seen to be things that we're called to seek to overcome. Now there are of course many important gatherings of representatives of Christian traditions which do not make the search for full structural and sacramental communion a key focus of the work. Think for example of the life and works movement focused on the need for Christian communities to present a united witness and proclamation to the world, regardless of the abiding substantive differences of structure, doctrine and practice which pertain between the traditions which they represent. Or one might think uh, more recently of the work of the Global Christian <coughs> Forum, whose primary purpose, as I understand it, and I apologize if I have this incorrect, um, primary purpose as I understand it, is to encourage into ecumenical engagement the myriad new evangelical and Pentecostal churches which do not usually engage with conciliar ecumenism and bilateral dialogues. Now what I want to say about life and works ecumenism is that uh, in some respects such life and work style initiatives in inter-ecclesial fellowship, prayer and worship I think are the very oxygen and lifeblood of Christian ecumenism. Unless we, are, um, unless we are meeting together, praying together, and growing to love and value each other, then little else is basically going to be possible. Equally, however, what I want to say, and that's, that's not just a rhetorical nod to say this, you know, it's a good thing before I stick the boot in on it. Uh, I really do want to acknowledge that this is a great uh, contribution of abiding significance. However, I also want to say, that no matter how many such initiatives we have, on their own, I believe them to be incapable of resolving the ecumenical problem, which at root uh, consists in the broken sign value that we give to the world when we proclaim reconciliation in Christ, but live structural and sacramental divisions in Christ's ecclesial body wherein we can't fully recognize and share in each other's ministry, authoritative teaching, and sacramental life. And for this, I think we need um, more than fellow and sororal feeling, more than shared prayer and action, and more than reconciled diversity without structural and sacramental communion. We need, I think, I think grace-filled repentance met by grace-filled conversion, repentance of the deep sin of division into which God has given us up, repentance of our own traditions, complicity within this divided state of the church, repentance of our blindness to the dreadful significance of these divisions, and repentance of our blindness also to the particular character of our own traditions, sinful complicity in them, whatever that might be. Now, of course, recognition of the scandalous significance of the divided state of the church and the commensurate importance of this formal theological ecclesial communion is by no means an exclusively Catholic trait. Um, it is, however, 
strongly resonant, I think, with the core Catholic instinct for living and thinking according to the whole. And it's also the case that it was given a remarkable boost by Catholicism's entrance into the somewhat belated entrance into the ecumenical project at Vatican II. A host of bilateral dialogues were subsequently established, each focused on identifying and seeking to overcome perceived historic causes of division. And over the decades, a range, a considerable range of strategies have been employed in service of this aim of seeking to overcome um, historic causes of division and move us to a place where we can be in um, differentiated but full structural sacramental communion. I'm just going to talk through um, some of the, it's not exhaustive, um, it might be exhausting, but it's not exhaustive. <laughs> I'm going to talk through um, a, few, a number of these strategies and then play with them for a bit. So um, we might think of the ecumenism of repentance, of tribalism. I'm using um, that to refer to, as I was talking about, the my own Liverpool context. Liverpool is quite a diverse city, um, but certainly back in the 60s, 70s, it was still what I would have called as somewhat in a pejorative sense, tribal city in the sense that people lived in their own identities, their own communities. Kind of, I, I, I sound the last generation of the Liverpool ghetto Catholic. Um, so repentance of tribalism and of narrowed vision, the ecumenism of charitable representation and the overcoming of misunderstandings, moving from caricatures of each other forged in polemic through to attending charitably to the reality of each other. Um, ecumenism of openness to fresh understanding, drawing upon what um, uh, contemporary scholarship has been able to open up for us in terms of fresh ways of understanding, fresh ways of understanding both of the other and of the common tradition that we share. Ecumenism of um, recognition of legitimate and necessary difference in communion, recognition that uh, we don't need to always say the same thing the exact same way, but can have complementary but distinct frames of understanding and, uh, and working. The ecumenism of sharing one's gifts beyond the family, the immediate family, rather than hoarding them as treasures to be kept, offering them freely. Offering them freely without condition, uh, offering them for others to make of them what the others wish to make of them. Um, humanism of hope-filled imaginings of possibilities which are not yet, but which might be, and perhaps one day will be. That's, um, that was a strategy that became increasingly important in uh, the second major phase of Archic's work. Um, the ecumenism of, and this is um, particularly close to my own heart, the ecumenism of loving desire for that which appears good and attractive in the other. Recognizing that at its heart, ecumenism is basically a process of falling in love. Falling in love with what God's grace has nurtured in the other. Um, I sometimes refer to that as ecumenical erotics. Okay. Uh, and that's fine these days, because Be Benedict, Pope Benedict, you know, ex helped us to see that um, eros is actually an intrinsic part of true Christian love. So, um, the ecumenism of recognition of our own need for help. Again, um, I'm going to play with this in a little, in a while. Looking to the other not simply as potential recipient, of what God's grace has nurtured in one's own tradition, but as potential resource for the growth and healing of the difficulties and limitations in one's own home tradition. And um, the ecumenism of patient faith and realism, recognizing that we are servants, not architects. Recognizing that it takes time all growth, all growth takes time, both personally and even more so at the level of institutions and traditions. So let me just um, play with this a bit, and particularly exploring um, the first four points that were noted there. What I want to say about 
these and other, what, 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 think of them all as a whole sorry, at the moment, all these different um, strategies and others that we could think of. Let's think of them as the, uh, these are the different strands that collectively compose the multi-stranded cord, the multi-stranded rope of formal ecumenical activity. Um, these various strands, um, sure, they're not all equally operative in any given context. But what I want to say is that they can each be seen to have been variously operative over the years when we take a kind of long frame look at it. Of particular importance in the classical bilateral dialogues um, after Vatican II and from the late 60s onwards, of particular importance, so particularly in the earlier decades of that, has been, I think, the first four of these strategies which I identify. And, uh, I mean, somewhat sequentially, but, uh, but then in conjunction. I mean, think, for example, of the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. That was achieved through a combination of overcoming mistaken, caricatured understandings of each other that were forged through polemic. That combined with recognizing that the richness of Christian truth does not need always to be expressed in the exact same way in all contexts. And it was through that that Lutherans and Catholics were able to come to see their teaching as com compatible and indeed complementary. Now, there's a lot more we could say about the Joint Declaration, and I do think it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do all the work that needs to be done. It's a really significant, really significant marker but it's not to say that, that that particular process is just complete. There's all sorts of things, ways in which we need to grow into that with the challenge of receptive learning that I'll be saying later. But um, let's just note that what it did achieve was achieved through these powerful um, strategies. And more broadly, in Anglican Catholic dialogue, in the work of Archic, certainly throughout Archic, the first phase of Archic's work and well into the second phase, it was these strategies that proved immensely uh, powerful, successful in showing how to navigate a way beyond case after case of historic division. To take just one example, the issue of Eucharistic sacrifice and the way in which that was um, uh, uh, deftly handled by employing some of these strategies. And it's perhaps not, um, it's perhaps not without some cause then that the apparent success of these strategies led to very high hopes of unity being just around the corner. Um, and indeed, such, uh, but of course, such hopes were to be disappointed. Uh, those, those hopes which shaped and marked the early decades of ecumenical endeavor after Vatican II. Um, the tide seemed to go out on them and leave us uh, washed up on the, the shore of uh, formal ecumenism with a significant energy drain behind it. Uh, apparently in, a, in, an, in an, an impasse, not knowing, confused as to how has it been so powerful and successful and how, is it, uh, how are they no longer able to achieve success for us. Because the strategies which previously seemed so powerful then seemed to run out of steam as they moved through, um, well I think it was as they moved through the relative softwood the issues that, lended, that rendered themselves to being dealt with in this way. As we moved through the softwood and encountered the hardwood issues of real difference, which could not be explained away as differing but complementary ways of dealing with the same reality. These strategies, these first earlier four strategies, as powerful though they are, are in some respects strategies of explaining traditions as they are more accurately to each other. What they change is our perception of each other. They don't necessarily change anything within the traditions. And um, let's think, uh, as we move from those kinds of issues, uh, they became uh, it, more challenging. For example, in the Anglican Catholic context, we might think of the fundamentally different structures and practices of ecclesial authority and global communion, which exist in the traditions. On the one hand, where Anglicanism is focused around provincial autonomy. Catholicism is focused around a strongly centered model of authority through communion with the Bishop of Rome. These are not 
Um, these are not simply two ways of telling the same story. They are actually two quite different ways of organising how the church, uh, of understanding how the church is uh, to be organised. And what I'm wanting to say is that in relation to such matters of substantive difference, real substantive difference, the strategies of clarification and complementarity, um, the first four on this list, um, cease to be effective. Here, when we, when we engage with these more substantive differences, I think we need to draw out some of the other strands within the ecumenical cord, strands which have been there, perhaps more in the background, um, beating away, shaping much of the work, giving some of the spirit to the work, but now perhaps needing to be brought into the foreground. Because what we, um, so moving, the challenge of moving the softwood to kind of hardwood issues, what we need are strategies which expose each tradition to the challenge and promise of the different ways of understanding and organizing things to be found in the other traditions. So we need, I think, strategies aimed at more at the conversion of the traditions so that they can each journey together somewhere new rather than strategies aimed at the um, immediate convergence. And this is what receptive ecumenism is seeking to do. It seeks to offer a constructive way forwards for formal ecumenism at a time when it can seem that we've ended up in something of a cul-de-sac. And the principle behind that is that uh, the God of Jesus Christ and the Spirit is not a God who leads us into cul-de-sacs to prod us with sticks and tell us how we've got things wrong, but a God who opens possibilities. Okay? So we might need to attend patiently to what those possibilities are, um, but possibilities will, will be there for us to discern. Receptive ecumenism is trying to discern a way forwards in the apparent cul-de-sac of um, formal ecumenism. Okay, so thus far in the first part, I've given a bit of an argument as to why formal ecumenism is important, and um, I've given a bit of an argument for the changing moods and moments in that, and now I'm wanting to turn to look at what's going on with receptive ecumenism. At the heart of receptive ecumenism is the conviction that further progress is indeed possible on the way towards full structural and sacramental unity, but only if a fundamental counter-instinctual move is made away from the tradition wishing that others could be more like themselves, um, which basically is a, a lot of what goes on in ecumenical, I mean, we, we understand that we love our traditions, we wouldn't be in them if we didn't. And we kind of think, wouldn't it just be so much easier if the others were a bit more like us? <laughs> and, and say as we have got gifts, why can't they see that we've got gifts? Um, well, receptive ecumenism, we want to say that rather than spending our time kind of, you know, hoping that we can get you to see how brilliant Catholicism is and then we'll all be, we'll all be fine, that, um, that what we instead need to do is to ask ourselves what we need to, uh, what we can and must learn with dynamic integrity from our own respective others, in ways that can help to address the specific challenges with which we are struggling. Now, for those who've been able to decipher what's on the um, what's on the screen, you'll all be familiar with the famous J.F. Kennedy reversal: "Ask not what your country can do for you; ask rather what you can do for your country." Well, there's a similar reversal at work in receptive ecumenism. It says, "Ask not what your others should learn." From your tradition, ask rather what your own tradition can learn from these others. And Pope Francis um, says something similar in Evangelii Gaudium. Indeed, he says things much more explicitly resonant with this in, um, in addresses in the context of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity, but this is a nice, short, a snappier one. In section 246, he says, If we really believe in the abundantly free working of the Holy Spirit, we can learn so much from one another. It is not just about being better informed about others, but rather about reaping what the Spirit has sown in them, which is also meant to be a gift for us. Now, such receptive ecclesial learning is envisaged as operating, and this is very important, it's, op it's envisaged as operating not simply in relation to the kind of easier issues of stuff like hymnody, and spirituality and devotional practices 
and even pastoral strategy. It's envisaged as operating in relation to doctrinal self-understanding. Uh, I won't go on about it in this talk, but the uh, justification issue that we touched on a moment ago, I think there's some really important receptive learning for Catholicism still to do by attending to what the Lutheran instincts are there. It goes beyond just being able to bring our languages into conversation with each other, but to really take seriously what's going on in the depth of it. So it extends beyond those other um, matters to doctrinal self-understanding, and even more so, it extends to respective structural and ecclesiological realities, the different ways in which we are organized as church and understand what it means to be church. So, well, if that's the basic vision, you've got the kind of, um, you've got the, you, you, you've got the two-minute version of receptive acumen so far. Now what I want to do is to drill down a bit and draw out some of the principles which are in play here. And I'll, um, I'm going to touch on five key principles that, uh, are, are, that we're working with. Um, receptive acumenism believes that in the context of the more mature dialogues, the ones that have been running for quite some time, the convergence concern to overcome historic divisions through such means as clarifying misunderstandings, using fresh concepts to say together what previously could only be said apart, and recognizing the validity of distinct but compatible theological frameworks. Receptive Acumen wants to say that on the whole, those strategies have gone as far as they can for the time being. Um, for all the real achievements of processes such as those um, leading to the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, receptive ecumenism recognizes that some seemingly insuperable obstacles and substantive ecclesial differences still stand in the path of full sacramental and structural communion. Obstacles and difficulties which do not um, lend themselves to being explained away either as misunderstandings or as alternative ways of articulating the same reality. And that, of course, um, that's a criticism that has been leveled against bilateral ecumenism, that it, it, its success is premised on a bit of a sleight of hand, of showing, of being able to say, look, these, these languages are not incompatible and they can speak to each other, uh, but in a way that doesn't necessarily really grapple with the substantive force that lies behind some of these principles. I mean, that's uh, Cardinal Ratzinger used to point this out, and, and the, some of the Lutherans, the more conservative inclined Lutherans, pointed it out. Um, and what we're trying to do here in Receptive Acute is to say, you know, there's something in that. And yet, some issues, the point is not that that's always the case. Some issues really are just about misunderstanding and miscomprehensions of what's, of what's possible. But there are other differences that are substantive, and we need a different approach to it. Another principle at work in receptive ecumenism is that receptive ecumenism recognizes that we're going to be living with some of these substantive theological, procedural, and structural differences between the churches for a longer time than some earlier generations of ecumenists had hoped and believed to be the case. Commonality and full communion in understanding, practice, and structure are simply not within our tangible grasp. Now, let me be clear in saying this. I am not saying that this is a good thing, that we should sort of embrace this fact with joy in our hearts. I'm not saying that. Um, nor am I saying that we should just reconcile ourselves to this permanently being the case. What I'm saying is that we need to be realistic about recognizing that this, whether we like it or not, this is the current situation in which we find ourselves. And the point is that Christian hope, Christian hope is not optimism. Christian hope takes reality seriously and finds a way forwards in and through that. So, um, sure, as I've said, it's a situation for which we need to repent and from which we need conversion. But it is where we are and there's no benefit to be had from pretending otherwise. So receptive ecumenism represents a move away from ecumenical idealism, a move away from ecumenical optimism, and a move towards a hope-filled ecumenical realism. Let's have a look at a third principle. Um, 
Receptive ecumenism believes that what is now needed is a strategy which prioritizes the need <coughs> for significant ecclesial conversion within, within each tradition in the face of its ecumenical others, rather than strategies which seek for immediate ecumenical convergence between the traditions. So it's a kind of, it's, a, it's sort of lateral thinking in a way. It spins the telescope round and is trying to serve the cause of unity by not in the first instance simply seeking to take us to a place of unity uh, and reconciled understanding, but actually doing something within each of our respective traditions. The assumption is that the other's differences, the assumption is that the other's differences represent valuable gifts from which we're called to learn and receive in ways that can help to heal the specific sinful distortions in our own tradition. Gosh, that's a challenge. I'm going to have to cut out a whole section, but I'll do that. Yeah. Um, you, you, can, you can take a little bit more time than that, Paul. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, go ahead. Okay. What I'll do is, um, there is a section that um, you might be interested in, but rather than we deliver it in lecture mode, I'll tell you what's, what's in it, and we can tease it out into the Q&A if you want. Yeah? So, um, so the, the further assumption is that acting in this way will both enrich our own tradition and help to create, and help to create long term, the conditions in which full ecclesial communion will eventually become possible. So it is serving unity, but it's serving it on the long game. Um, so receptive ecumenism proceeds by bringing to fore the dispositions of self-critical hospitality, humble learning, and ongoing conversation, conversion that have always been quietly essential to good ecumenical work, and by turning them into the explicit required strategy and core task of contemporary ecumenism. The reason, Francis, I'm going on so long, you see, is I'm, I'm trying to be a good boy, and <laughs> you, you, your instructions said you don't just want a formal lecture delivered, you know? You want them to, you want a bit of PowerPoint, you want a bit of engagement. But the problem is, um, I write formal lectures and I know how long they are. And then if I go off piste and start talking like a proper human being, then it takes me twice as long, you see. So, you know, I've written a lecture and I'm only going to do half of it, but then we go. <laughs> Any of you who are suffering from insomnia, you can come to the Lincoln Hotel later on. We'll that. Um, so, a fourth, um, yeah. A fourth principle is there's a certain self-interested practicality of our receptive ecumenism, which relates to a sharpened recognition within each of our traditions <clears throat> that for all our gifts, we nevertheless each have our own particular wounds and difficulties, what I'm referring to as sinful distortions, which we can't easily resolve from within our own resources. Now, there's something about coincidence about this, but it's interesting, because in the time period, in the very phase during which we've moved to a greater period of ecumenical realism. And we've moved to that because we've had it thrust on us, not because we're particularly virtuous. We've had it thrust on us, we've had to recognize it. So also, within the traditions, we've each come, or many of us, have had to come to a more realistic perception of our own limits, difficulties, and distortions. And again, this is not because we've suddenly become more virtuous and self-aware, um, on the basis of virtues, because it's been thrust upon us. Um, we've been confronted by the reality of, wound, of our wounds, whether we like it or not, confronted by these realities through such things as the clerical sexual abuse crisis, and in the process have been disabused of some of the illusions we might have had about ourselves. And the point is that given that these are difficulties and wounds within our current thought and practice, and it's not easy to see how they can be resolved simply by staying within the logic of that existing thought and practice. That the larder has been found wanting. The larder of our existing resource in our given tradition has been found wanting. They show our need for a fresh resource and fresh perspective from without. And in this regard then, the immediate value of receptive ecumenical learning is that the different gifts and uh, perspectives um, the different gifts and perspectives of our ecumenical other, others are regarded as offering the promise of providing us with this fresh resource that we need in order to be able to address our own difficulties. So it's in this sense that receptive ecumenism is a somewhat self-interested call to conversion and transformation. 
um, self-interest in the sense that we're being called out of the things that are narrowing and confining us and into um, a greater life in Christ. And indeed, I actually want to say that the call to conversion is always um, in properly understood uh, self-interested, um, in our true self-interest. The fifth point, then, is that um, uh, much ecumenical engagement is a matter, I think, of getting the best China tea service out, of showing ourselves somewhat formally in the best possible light to our distant relatives who are coming to visit. You know, we want to we want them to kind of get you know how Catholicism is on its best day, um, uh, but receptive ecumenism again is kind of counterintuitive because it's a more warts and all approach to ecumenism. It wants to show the more warts and all understanding we have of ourselves, but that we tend to keep locked behind the closed doors of the intimate family space. So rather than the ecumenism of the best China tea service, receptive ecumenism represents an ecumenism of the wounded hands, and there's a kind of Christological reference in there, of being prepared to show our wounds to each other, knowing that we can't heal or save ourselves, and asking that the other minister to us from the particular gifts and grace uh, giving to them. So if we put all this together, we could say that receptive ecumenism is intended as an instrument of ecclesial reform and renewal. It doesn't seek to just leave things as they are. It could be understood as um, a practice of resourcement against the lost gifts of Christ and the Spirit in the other traditions. But we also I want to put some clarifications in place here. Um, for all that, um, what makes receptive ecumenism a formal theologically driven mode of ecumenical engagement is that receptive ecumenism does not think that a purely instrumentalist pick and mix adoption of interesting looking practices in other traditions is adequate or acceptable. Rather, receptive ecumenism believes that the respective webs of understanding, habit, procedure, and structure within each of the traditions need to be brought into conversation with each other with a view to pursuing a theologically rigorous process of testing as to how, with dynamic integrity and appropriate transposition, the host tradition might coherently receive from the donor tradition on the basis of a combination of creative expansion retrieval and reconfiguring, which I think are basically the, dyna the dynamics that have always shaped the, um, the evolution, the, 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 the continuance of the Christian theological tradition. So that's our second major section on receptive ecumenism. The next major section I'm not going to do now, the, that would have been uh, looking at receptive ecumenism in practice, because you'll be sitting there quite legitimately saying, oh, this all sounds well and good, but what does it look like in practice? For what did it look like in practice? One example would be um, some sort of the work that Archic 3 has currently been engaged with in looking at the way in which Anglicans and Catholics respectively understand and structure the church um, uh, the, and the, the communion of the church at local, regional and uh, global international levels. So if we want to tease some of that out in the Q&A, uh, we can do so and I can kind of turn the leaf a little bit on some of the work that Father Vimal and Sister Teresa and myself and colleagues have been doing um, but uh, I'll leave that aside for now. The, the final section of the... Um, look at all this stuff you've been saved from. Aren't you glad? <laughs> so, the final thing I want to just spend a few minutes on, um, if you could bear with me, is the final section of the paper where I was turning to ask this question of why the claim that formal ecumenism is uh, what lies behind the claim that I've heard a number of times in various places that formal ecumenism of the kind that I've been describing uh, does not seem to have the same pull and resonance in global south uh, contexts. Um, I want to push this a bit and try to get a sense of what's going on here and I'm doing this by asking a series of questions and they are very genuine questions that I don't have any answers to. I'm just trying to imagine my way in to what some of the issues might be. So, first question I would ask is, um, does, if, if, does this reflect the kind of prioritizing of life and works ecumenism over faith and order ecumenism that was encouraged during Conrad Razor's period in office at the World Council of Churches? If so, then I find myself reflecting that whilst that shift from um, 
faith and order ecumenism to life and works ecumenism. Whilst I can see that it fits fairly comfortably with evangelical and Pentecostalist dispositions, which take freedom in Christ um, to give priority to ecclesial independence, it's, um, it would be an approach that I think fits less comfortably with the core Catholic instinct that I've been describing earlier for the structural and sacramental unity of the church. So that leads me in turn to say that um, what uh, shape then does the Catholic instinct for ecclesial communion take in global South contexts? Is it still um, a gift? a witness that can usefully be brought to the table of ecumenical interaction in such contexts. Well, perhaps it is, but perhaps also it is the case that it's just not the most pressing of the challenges facing the church in Global South contexts. Um, nor perhaps is it felt to be the most important of the contributions which, can follow, which Catholicism can make there. Um, I don't know, I'm interested to find, hear more about this. Perhaps the intensely pressing nature of the need to work for economic justice, social care, environmental concern, and the priority of basic human solidarity simply serves to somewhat displace and reframe any inter-ecclesial concern for formal ecumenism in Global South. Context. Perhaps that's what's going on. And perhaps this is all the more so in contexts, um, Asian contexts particularly, um, in which Christian communities collectively, even taken collectively, are a tiny minority relative to the prevailing culture. Again, perhaps in such contexts, the, um, the, 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 the concern about structural sacramental communion just isn't uh, doesn't seem to be the priority that it can feel like in other contexts. Um, perhaps it is that the classic topics of bilateral ecumenical dialogues, we've mentioned justification a few times, are felt to be somewhat alien to the churches of the global south, products of a global north history and experience which does not need to be reproduced and imposed on the churches of the global south. Indeed, perhaps the very denominational divides are themselves experienced as being part of the colonial legacy and associated territorialism that needs to be resisted. And perhaps the relative scarcity of ordained ministers of the mainline traditional Christian denominations leads to a natural fluidity and permeability of ecclesial identity in some contexts, such that Christians um, can find themselves already, such that Christians in such contexts can find themselves already anticipating what it might mean to be the one people of God. Well, if so, thus viewed, formal ecumenism from that perspective might appear as a kind of, well, necessary tidying up exercise which must indeed urgently be addressed elsewhere, so that the scandal which prevents the people of God more widely from living this communion uh, might be overcome. But what might we say about the possible role of receptive ecumenism in the face of such questions and challenges? Can it in any way be a resource for the churches in Global South contexts? And here, the first thing I want to say is that receptive ecumenism and the basic disposition it represents of self-critical receptive learning is not a one-size-fits-all reality. It's more like a virtuous virus which adapts to context and circumstance. <coughs> so what that means is that it is actually for the diverse local churches of the global um, church, uh, uh, the, the, the diverse local churches of the world church each to ask themselves what the specific challenges and priorities, uh, challenges and opportunities might be for receptive learning in their own context. What I would want to say is that I am confident that there will be 
challenges and opportunities for such receptive learning in each and every one of those contexts. It might have, a, it might have quite markedly different characters as to what seems to be possible and important in different contexts, but the opportunities and challenges will be there. Second thing I want to say is that a, um, a commitment to receptive ecumenical learning does not depend on reciprocity. It can be a unilateral initiative. I can choose to attend to what I can learn from you, even if you have no interest in learning from me. Yeah? Catholics can attend to what they can learn from new evangelical churches, even if new evangelical churches do not want to do business with Catholics. Okay? It's not a zero sum. Um, another thing I want to say here is that the worldwide growth of Pentecostalism, one of the remarkable features of um, the 20th and into 21st century of Christianity, the worldwide growth of, of Pentecostal, particularly in global south contexts, represents, I think, a vital opportunity for receptive Catholic learning in these kinds of specific regards. Um, might more frequently be spoken of as um, a significant challenge for Catholic mission in these contexts. Um, what I wanted to say is let's look at what the call and opportunity and actually responsibility for Catholic learning vis-a-vis -vis Pentecostalism is. Um, I would identify um, briefly two things here. First thing, which I'm finding myself for a number of reasons um, um, reconsidering the sort of need to place emphasis on this. On the one hand, I think um, that's going to require us to think through more explicitly than we frequently tend to do in Catholic theological conversation. The realm of the spirit world and of evil as a personal force. And here I think the challenge is to think this through in a way that is intelligent, not silly, and not damaging. On the other hand, and this is closer to the kinds of things I'm uh, working on myself at the moment, uh, I think it requires us to rethink the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the Church, the whole Church, as one of constantly renewed promise and gift rather than secure possession and delegated power. Um, it's, it's a bit of an unfair contrast, but there is nevertheless some truth in that caricature of how Catholic thinking of the relationship between spirit and church has tended to go. We've tended to, our default is towards identifying stable structures of grace, whether it be in the individual character and virtue, or whether it be in the church in terms of ministry and authority. Now much more needs to be said about each of these points, but it's interesting that each of them represent characteristic features of Pope Francis's teaching, our Global South Pope. As too does the seriousness and matter-of-factness with which he engages Pentecostalism. It's also interesting to note, and this is a kind of ironic twist at the end here, I'll tell you that just in case you don't notice it, um, it's also interesting to note that the second of these points, the points about Holy Spirit and Church, takes us right into an issue which lay at the theological core of the Lutheran Reformation. It takes, I'm referring here to um, the contrast between the Lutheran, a Lutheran occasionalist approach to grace, emphasizing the need for active trust in relation to God, when compared with the more typical Catholic emphasis on the being God-given stable structures of grace within the individual and within the church. So, perhaps these historic issues are not, in fact, as irrelevant as we might assume. Just as the church of the global north is learning how deeply it needs to attend to and learn from the experience of the church in the global south, so also, perhaps, the Church of the Global South should not be too quick to dismiss as irrelevant the sites of historic dispute and learning in Global North experience. Or let me put that another way. Let's, let's all think back.
to the work we've done at various points in our theological training. Just as the global church will rightly and necessarily continue to learn from the disputes, experience, and insights of the anti-Nicene and post-Nicene North African church, so can we all, indeed so must we all, learn from the sites of theological learning at issue in the European Reformations, if we're to make good sense of things like spirit-church relationship. So, let me um, come down to exit. Um, I return to the three questions that we had at the start, that I started with earlier, which we might explore in open conversation. How does the importance of the formal theological ecclesial economic agenda manifest in Global South contexts, if at all? How does the Catholic instinct for the need to hope for and to work towards full structural and sacramental communion engage with such contexts? And how might the thinking, insights, and practice of receptive ecumenism take specific root and come to particular flower in your own ecclesial, cultural, regional context? Thank you, and I apologize for having gone on longer than I should. So let me uh, be the first to thank Paul for that typical tour de force, and uh, I'm excited to kind of moderate and engage in a conversation with all of you. I have a pretty simple job. I'll invite you to come to the microphone. Um, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us your name and um, where you're from, and then either these three questions that Paul put forward or any others that you have for him. Uh, yes, hello, I'm a uh, Christian. I'm from the Chicago area. And uh, yes, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation, and there was a lot of things that I've been thinking about that, you know, it seemed like your presentation really touched upon. Now, I grew up uh, Pentecostal and converted into the Catholic Church, so it kind of reminded me a lot of these issues, you know, kind of really reminded me of different things that I have dealt with on a personal level. But when we're looking at this, like, on a more global level, for instance, um, like, for instance, the difference between high church, main, you know, mainstream Protestants, versus the more free-flowing nature of, you know, Pentecostal ways of being Pentecostal, you know, and then, of course, like you said, the structure and the authority of, you know, Catholicism, you know, in our Latin and Western life. Um, how, when you talk about this communion, I'm just wondering, would, can you really see Pentecostals really being willing to accept that? Because I could really see it more with maybe the high church being more easily absorbed into a Catholic communion, but even then, you know, how does the issue of the authority of the Pope plan, you know, are we going to say, well, in order for you to be in full communion with the church, that you must fully accept the Pope that's sitting on the Sea of Peter, which with Pentecostals, I don't know how well that's going to really be accepted, especially when there's plenty of trouble with it among. Protestants are the issues going back, you know, with Luther, or even looking at the Orthodox, such as the Eastern, which are very close as far as the sacraments and the liturgy, and they have plenty of issues with authority. So when you go all the way to the other side of that, with more free flowing churches with Pentecostals, how does that come together? And then when you compound that with the racial and cultural and historical issues that you talked about, North versus South. You know, the Anglo, you know, like you got the Anglo European context, and then you bring in, for instance, you know, like what you mentioned about North Africa and the diversity there. I mean, I just see, you know, how do you bring all of that into a communion with, you know, each other? Do you say, okay, I mean, I see the unity and diversity, I do see that, but what does that look like? Is it like an absolute surrender to the Pope? Is there like, to what degree does each side bend? You know, see, you see that? Paul has to say about yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Christian. It's a great question. Uh, I see you've, you've, got, you've got it in first rather than just before the break this time. <laughs> you, your, your question's lost to me. So, um, first thing I would say is uh, just a comment on um, individual, individual stories of, uh, of conversion between traditions. Um, we're not generally very good in uh, the Catholic Church at, um, at seeing that as a kind of resource. Um, we tend that we, our practice has tended to sort of be 
uh, it's almost like someone has pressed the restart button on, on the Christian identity and, and becoming Catholic. I think one of the challenges for us uh, is, to, is to see people who become Catholic as resource rich with uh, narrative and experience and sensitivities about uh, Christian experience and ecclesial reality that actually we need to be enriched by as a community. Yeah. So um, that was just one comment on that. Your other more substantive point. Um, so receptive accuracy is trying to be strategic. Yeah. But it's not a ten-point plan. Uh, which is seeking to deliver um, unity next year, 10 years, within a, within a designated time scale. Okay? Um, there's, there's an art of the possible and an opportunism built into receptive ecumenism. But what it wants to say is that e in each situation, the thing to do is to be um, honest about the difficulty within one's tradition that one is trying to address and to be um, uh, discerning and attentive attentive to what can be usefully learned from another tradition. Right? So um, uh, it is offering a different approach for the change context and it is saying in hope and faith that if multiple traditions are each doing the somewhat ad hoc but properly considered learning, then each tradition will be on the move. On the move in somewhat unpredictable ways, um, in a way that can't all be planned out at this point, because it's the movement of the spirit rather than the movement of, um, of, uh, of, te uh, of technique. Yeah? and um, industrial logic and reason. Um, so things will happen, things will, uh, and, and based on what is possible in a given context. The other thing it wants to say is that um, engaging with what is possible now opens up unforeseeable possibilities in the future. Things that just look like log jams will be less of a log jam when we're actually dealing with changed realities. Yeah? I mean, what other traditions think about uh, communion being focused through communion with the Bishop of Rome. Well, you've got to say kind of in fairness, it's no wonder, given how that has sometimes been played out within Catholicism, that other traditions rightly have fairly major concerns about it. Imagine a converted and reformed papacy that is truly Catholic, but Catholic in a way that is freed from some of the, um, const some of the narrowings of what communion with the Bishop of Rome has sometimes looked like, then your question might sound a bit different, yeah, and the possibilities might look different. When those of us who are, um, those who are runners, you, know, you run at, particularly in a flat country like this, you run at the horizon, and you find that it expands in front of you as you move towards it. So is it going to be the case with this kind of growth? Um, it will, the, the possibilities will expand as that which is currently realizable is taken. Yeah, that's, that's some of what I would say. Does that make any sense? Um, yes. yes. Well, Paul, it's uh, Paul to Paul. And um, first of all, thank you very much indeed uh, for your presentation. And uh, I'm with you all the way, but with one reservation that I'll come to in a minute. But first of all, I just want to express appreciation from an Anglican point of view for all that you've done for receptive ecumenism. Um, and how much you've given to this uh, cause and uh, how hard you've worked and I'm sure we all would, would agree with that. Um, I think receptive ecumenism has a lot to teach uh, all the major Christian traditions. I know you're mainly speaking to your own communion but I think what you have to say and what the uh, concept of receptive ecumenism represents is important uh, fully ecumenically. And my one reservation is this and I hope that this might be a point that you'll reconsider uh, for future presentations. When you say that uh, theological convergence has gone as far as it can go and therefore we need to find another way, I don't actually buy that. 
I think that the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, um, 1999, not that long ago, is an example of um, a recent, uh, a great leap forward in theological convergence. And I'm going to refer to this tomorrow afternoon when I give my own presentation. I'm going to be speaking about convergence and giving that as an example. Um, I wouldn't want to say, I think it's a, a bit of a counsel of despair to say theological convergence has gone as far as it can go. I don't think we should say that. Um, I think that we should exercise a self-denying ordinance and not actually say that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's for us to say. Um, but I would go a bit further than that and say that I believe that uh, receptive ecumenism as a theology, as an ecumenical method is actually a vehicle of deeper convergence and an avenue of convergence and um, it finds its logic and its place in relation to the uh, more profound convergence that we all seek. I think maybe the way you put it comes from um, understandably and thinking about convergence in a mainly cognitive way but I, surely convergence is um, not only a convergence in our thinking but um, a convergence of experience a uh, convergence of intentionality a convergence of desire and this is all part of the wholeness of the convergence that we find in the ecumenical movement and we see more of and um, you know when we have that kind of convergence of um, uh, experience, intentionality, desire, and so on, then we reach a point where that needs to be conceptualized and it needs to be held up for critical scrutiny and so that then takes its place within the formal theological uh, ecumenism. So uh, I've spoken long enough and uh, I, I don't believe in long questions and I'll try and shut myself in the foot. But uh, <laughs> I'll be grateful for your, for your response to that. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, yeah, there's... Uh, I think you, I think you make a very important point, and I will reflect further on how to um, express that more felicitously. It's the most important thing to say in response to what you're saying. Uh, I mean, just to um, clarify that I'm actually not doing a carte blanche. Uh, I mean, I, I see that how it could be heard as giving a carte blanche rejection of convergence. I'm, I'm not actually giving a carte blanche rejection of it. So the phrase I used was that um, the strategies of convergence in relation to the more mature dialogues has likely gone, has possibly gone as far as it can on most fronts for the time being. Now there's a lot that needs um, nuancing and qualifying there. So firstly, uh, in relation to younger uh, dialogues, then we are still very much in the, in the business of clearing up misperceptions, which is one of those early strategies. Um, and I'll leave that caveat as to possibly on most fronts for the time being. So, you know, the door is open to saying perhaps there'll come a time when we can kind of retrocharge some of that, some of those strategies again. Um, so that's, that's some qualifications of that. Another qualification I've put is that, um, as you know, as you understand fully, receptive humanism is certainly not saying, look, we're just going to reconcile ourselves to these abiding permanent differences. It's not saying that. Uh, it does, uh, albeit playing a somewhat long game, it is wanting to, by change, by, by, inviting and encouraging each of the traditions to go through their own process of transformation. It is wanting to um, open the possibility of a situation in which um, our dividing differences become non-dividing distinctions. And when our, when our currently dividing differences become non-dividing distinctions, um, then we are able to be in full communion with each other. And you might say, well, surely convergence is an acceptable kind of language for that. And I, I, as long as we understand convergence in a richer way, diversified way you want to, I'd say absolutely. My kind of discomfort with the language of convergence is um, I think it 
for me, it's too suggestive. I realise it doesn't have to be like this, but I just find it too suggestive of um, coming to an identity of articulation. And I, I, I don't believe we need to come to an identity of articulation. The other reason why I have a resistance to it, and you know, maybe this is something I need to get over, I think is what you're inviting me to consider. Uh, the other reason I have a bit of resistance to it is that um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely dismissive of the kind of criticism that people like Ratzinger made of some classic bilateral moves, where Ratzinger um, heard it as being ultimately uh, um, an insufficient sleight of hand, nothing things, the priority being to get people on the same page, to get people to convergence, but at the cost of taking um, of taking the real identity of the tradition seriously. That, that is one of the things I am sympathetic to. Um, and not because I'm wanting to say, um, look, the whole humus of things are a waste of time, um, we kind of need to preserve our distinctiveness. No, I want to take the distinctiveness of the identity seriously because I think oh, it's only by doing that that we can ultimately come to a real, a real communion with each other that has learned from each other properly learned from each other, rather than just learned how to learn how to put French and English in conversation with each other. Vincent. Vincent, sorry. Yeah, Vincent. Um, uh, thank you for this lecture on uh, receptive ecumenism. Uh, based on what we can learn from others, and not necessarily what others can learn from us. Based on this, I, uh, during the coffee break, I was talking with two friends, of um, the experience I usually have. Uh, also, I'm the director of Office of Ecumenism in my diocese in Italy. And uh, sometimes my bishop may be jokingly, he will always say when we, when we are in the practical field of uh, ecumenism, maybe meeting, prayer, fellowship, or something, we always say, Vincent, be careful, so that they do not take you away. <laughs> so he will laugh about it. But I always fear, I always fear there is a, a little bit of reticence you hear a little bit of uh, tension. So I just wanted to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the Second Vatican Council's uh, decree on uh, ecumenism, unitatis uh, in any way at all, paves a way for or indicates or recommends uh, receptive ecumenism, or did it just uh, simply propose principles to tolerate other Christian faiths? I absolutely do think it, um, it lays the ground for it, Vincent. And um, there's um, um, Lewis uh, and um, um, Mida Volpe are about to bring out a, uh, I think it's a handbook, you know, one of these uh, big OUP handbooks of. So they've got a handbook of um, Catholicism, or, uh, um, uh, and I've got an essay in that on um, Roman Catholicism and ecumenism. And I sh uh, try and show how receptive humanism is not just kind of loosely resonant with Catholic ecumenical instincts, but is strongly shaped by it and in service of it. I don't think I don't think Catholic tradition is the only tradition that you can do that with. But um, and you know the the work of Congar that feeds into Unitatis Redintegratio is all over the shaping of what um, receptive ecumenism is. So I do think it is, um, uh, it's not just coincidental that we can put them in conversation with each other. Uh, I think, um, and some of the principles, you know, Rinatasa, Rinatasa, well, it recognizes, um, it recognizes Catholic complicity in, in the, the fractures of the Reformation. That's a significant point. Uh, it recognizes um, the movement of grace and spirit in the other traditions. Uh, it recognizes, uh, and John Paul II pulled some of this out very explicitly when he spoke about the way in which things can have come to, um, things can have come to great, greater blossom, flower in another tradition. It's not that they're alien to Catholicism, and it's not that they don't reside in Catholicism at all, but the thwarted, things that are thwarted 
in Catholicism have come to full flower in other traditions. So the principle of you know of not just simply of not simply saying that um, the other traditions have something of what Catholicism has, but going the extra step of saying the other traditions actually can show back to Catholicism more clearly what is authentic what is authentic to the church and what Catholicism only has in diminished and thwarted form. Yeah. So I think it's, I definitely think it's all that. I just want to make a little bit of sense. I don't make always anyway. Very from Chica. Yeah. So um, I don't know why it is easier to come to a convergence through the trajectory you are making, openness, sincerity, learning from other traditions. What I what the, the learning tradition doesn't have, perhaps, or what is weakened. How would it be easier to come to convergence, more than being easier to come to divergence, where every tradition that is learning becomes stronger and find it more difficult for a dialogue? Because my sense of logic tells me that individual traditions that are learning become stronger and becomes more difficult than thinking that it will eventually lead to convergence because I'm not seeing where the logic begins for me to you know, get to that point of convergence through your project. Thanks that in two different ways. Thanks for that, Chica. Um, one would be that um, uh, I guess the principle is about saying that uh, by, by learning something from the other, which speaks into a difficulty in our own tradition, that as well as um, helping to enrich the quality of ecclesial existence in our own tradition, um, we are appropriating something of that other tradition so that the um, we are recognizing something in that other tradition of great value, which gives us gives us a sense of greater affinity with them, with that tradition. So also it's possible that that other tradition will be able to recognize something of itself more clearly in our tradition. Yeah? That's the kind of basic principle kind of. In terms of moving from the abstract to a specific, so um, in Anglican and Catholic context, so I alluded to Catholic system of communion and authority being focused through, in a very centered way, through communion with the Bishop of Rome. So um, it's no secret that Catholicism struggles to know how to um, uh, give, give the appropriate place to the voice of the local churches in the shaping of Catholic teaching. Yeah? Um, then we've got an asymmetric issue in Anglicanism. Uh, and in a sense, it's not for Catholics in the receptive ecumenical context, not for Catholics to kind of focus on that, for Anglicans to hold that conversation. But um, it seems relatively uncontentious to say that if Catholicism's problem is that it's got too strong a center and too weak a theology and practice of the local church, then Anglicanism uh, can look like it potentially has an issue about holding it all together, but uh, has extraordinarily capacity to do the local church and diversity. Yeah. So um, if Catholicism's way of living, and this is, came out in uh, one of the other conversations, if Catholicism's way of living communion through the Bishop of Rome can be reconfigured in a way that does more appropriate justice to the, the, the local churches and a reciprocal accountability, then that begins to look like um, a way of configuring that that might be less alien to a, an Anglican sensitivity. See what I'm saying? That's the basic principle. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful talk. My name is Justin. Justin, thank you. Uh, I have a question about convergence as well. And what, um, 
what we could possibly learn from the experience of the Eastern Catholic Churches uh, when it comes to convergence. I realize bringing up Eastern Catholic Churches uh, brings up a, a whole set of problems around, say, Balaman and its accusation that unitism is uh, a, a very bad way of going about ecumenism because it breaks up local churches and unites part of them to Rome. But then, the experience of the Eastern Catholic Churches in themselves, you know, in, in applying the instruction for the, the litur applying the liturgical principles, the code of canons of the Eastern Catholic Churches. In, in that document, uh, the Eastern Catholic Churches are instructed to cast away all foreign um, introductions to their liturgy and to, and to come into uh, their own reception of their own tradition. And yet they remain communion with Rome. And so I was wondering uh, whether that might be an avenue for reconfiguring uh, what you're talking about in terms of the Catholic experience of being in communion with Rome. There's not just one way to the Latin church, but there are, in fact, 24 ways. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks very much for that, Justin. It's really helpful and important. So um, you referred to the, the history, um, the narratives of sin and the narratives of grace are not written on facing pages. You know, they're interlinear and interwoven. Um, so recognizing that there's, there's been, there are difficulties in the history, uh, but that doesn't mean to say that there is not something of tremendous grace in what the reality now presents us with. And I think you identify that absolutely correctly, that um, it, uh, first and foremost, it's about saying something about the, the proper, real diversity that should uh, that should be more evident within the Catholic communion. Yeah, and um, that's therefore saying that the journey, uh, a journey towards communion and recognition, is really not. And, and again, this is perhaps one of the things that lies behind. Um, by um, tending not to use the language of convergence. Mm. I, I, I don't see, it's a, not a one size fits all. It's pluriform, yeah? yeah. Um, one of the, uh, uh, um, the Christmas tree at home when I was growing up, and the Christmas tree we have in our own home now, um, has a strange and eclectic collection of ornaments on it. You know, there's, there's things that we bought when we were on our honeymoon and our first holidays, things that we've been given off grandparents' trees. There's a, so there's, there's not, um, it's not like one of those things you see in a department store which has a, a, unif a, a cleanness to it, you know? And I, I, I just love our Christmas tree. I absolutely love our Christmas tree. Mm. Um, and I keep seeing different things in it, you know? Mm. And I realized one year, I think that's a vision of the church. I think that's a vision of the church reconciled. That it's, it's, it, 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 the, the, the whole, the whole requires all those different particularities. Mm -hmm. uh, or another way into this would be, um, you know, Aquinas asks the question, well, why is there, why are there so many different kinds of things? Why are there so many different kinds of things? There are so many different kinds of things, he tells us, because no one thing can in any manner manifest the glory of God in any sense adequately. But each and everything does manifest something of the glory of God. So it's only with a tremendous pluriformity held together in creation that the glory of God can more adequately be manifest and celebrated. That, that is what the church is about as well. Right. The church is meant to be sacramental of that. Yeah. Of that abund the abundance, right. the abundance of God right. held in communion. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Join me in thanking Paul for... <laughs>